Okay, so we're at the top of the hour now. So I'd like to welcome everybody to the very first um, FinTech Open Source Foundation virtual meetup. Um, it's 11 a.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. in the afternoon in the UK. And I'm James McLeod, uh, the Director of Community at the FinTech Open Source Foundation. Um, I'm your host uh, for today, which means that um, I'm the person you should call out to uh, if you have any questions. Um, I'm also the person who's going to make sure that people's lines are muted, as we will be having the chance to ask questions a little bit later. Um, before I actually introduce you to uh, Nick Colbert, the FDC3 project creator and project chair um, here at Finos, um, I'd like to let everybody know that we are running a series of um, virtual meetups, uh, with the next one being um, from Tom Shady, um, who's the CTO of GreenKey, uh, who will be running a meetup um, next week on the seven unexpected lessons um, from two years of their SDK in banks. Um, so please do keep an eye on uh, Finos um, on Twitter and also on LinkedIn. And please do uh, visit us at finos.org and sign up to newsletters and notifications, et cetera, where we will be announcing these. And um, we will also have um, Aaron uh, running a bit of commentary um, on the chat over this particular meetup where all links will be posted. So you'll be able to sign up as we go on. Um, so now, so you don't have to listen to me um, witter on through, the, through this meetup, I'd like to introduce you to Nick Colbert. Um, who will be presenting FDC3 um, uh, 1.1 today. Over to you, Nick. Hey, thank you, James. And I want to also thank Finos and everyone for um, for organizing this and everyone for coming out uh, or virtually coming out to uh, participate in this today. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk to you all about FDC3. Um, the first real question is, why FTC3? Why put these kinds of standards together? So let's take a look at the world before FDC3. Apps get developed as they always have. And we always have more than one app, right? And so uh, if we want these apps to interoperate, the way to do this in the past has been through creating proprietary bilateral protocols and APIs, where basically developers sit down from different dev teams, usually in different organizations, and work out how they're gonna pass messages back and forth. Um, an optimization to this is uh, an app may uh, publish a, its own API that it makes a bit more public um, so that a developer can discover that API read the documentation and implement it uh, within their app in order to connect. And this is a bit better, but it still requires discovery by developers, um, as well as um, coding to a number of different APIs potentially as uh, the number of apps that want to interoperate grows as they will. So as you add more and more apps to the mix, you just get an accumulation of, um, you know, interconnectivity that has to be done all through different APIs. The world with FDC3 is a bit different. In this case, all applications and application developers just need to speak one language. They just need to write to the FDC3 API, and then once that's done, the level of complexity for interoperability is flat, and with each application that's added into the ecosystem, there is not this sort of exponential growth in cost of making things interoperate. Also, FTC3 works across any number of given technologies, since it's just a standard and not a, um, a code library. Uh, which means that today FTC3 is in production on OpenFin, on ChartIQ's Finsemble, Glue42. There's implementations in Electron, in Java, in .NET, as well as Chrome. So how did we get here with this group? Um, 
Some of you may know this, but I'm just going to quickly go through a brief history of FTC3 as an organization. So we were founded in October of 2017 by OpenFIN. Uh, we had a slide deck and about 12 initial participants that were various technologists across the industry who are interested in this problem of interoperability. Um, in May of 2018, we were contributed into Finos, and at that point, the organization had really grown and created structure around working groups on specific uh, areas like context data and APIs and app directories. Um, and then in the like Q4 of 2019, we uh, published the first FTC 3.1.0 standard, right? And this was a big accomplishment. Um, and there were a huge number of organizations involved with that. And then over the past year, really in 2019, we saw that um, uh, really grow uh, in terms of the implementations are going to production. And today we have FACSA in production, this OpenFIN, Glue42, uh, JP Morgan, ChartIQ, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the list is uh, pretty significant. And um, where we are today is that we now have 1.1 one, one has just been ratified and it really moves this uh, whole capabilities of FTC 3 forward significantly. Uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge the uh, breadth and depth of the organizations that have uh, participated in FTC 3 um, over the past two years plus, and this is uh, all the um, active and passive participants in FTC 3 by organization as well as the number of individuals that have actively contributed to creating the standard, making it a reality. And this isn't all of them, but this is a, uh, you can see it's, it's quite a group of people and of organizations that have really made this happen. So let's talk about 1.1. One, one. So you can today go to the ftc3.finos.org site um, and see the one one spec. It is um, in the final days of being uh, uh, ready for official release, um, and we are all very excited about it. The three main areas that one one expands upon are in the addition of the channels API, um, which uh, addresses use cases like color linking, as well as uh, channels, direct channels between different applications to publish data, um, and ex a greatly expanded uh, set of context data uh, that can be used to pass uh, context information between applications, as well as a number of improvements to the developer experience really based on real world feedback that we've gotten since the 1.0 release as people have been uh, doing implementations. So this is the uh, TypeScript interface for the desktop agent. So for those of you that are not, um, you know, FTC3 geeks, um, the desktop agent is our terminology for any platform that is implementing the FTC3 API. It's, Kind of a reference to the user agent term, which is a the abstract form of a browser. Um, the as you can see on the bottom, we have the additional channels APIs that have been added to this to the FTC three API, and you can see that this is really a big expansion of the surface area of the API, and this allows um, applications to do things like get the system channels that would be um, made available by the platform the application is uh, working with, as well as to join one of those channels or to leave a channel or even to get an, or create its own app level channel. The channel object itself allows you to broadcast directly onto the channel as well as to listen to it um, and to get its current state. Uh, as we expanded context 
data. And these are the new context data types that have been added. There are nine of them. Um, we can see that uh, this allows you to do a lot more business specific things such as uh, portfolios and positions, as well as handle um, multiples of contexts, like being able to handle an instrument list as opposed to a single instrument, which what the original um, FTC3 use cases were mostly focused on. Um, I also want to point out that these were uh, these standards were created in conjunction with the financial objects uh, uh, program in Finos as well, and that was a really great example of, of cross program collaboration within Finos. Um, and finally, we added um, a number of things to improve the developer experience in one one. A big part of this was um, the uh, creation of reference sections for context and intents. So before, honestly, in 1.0, the, the documentation was pretty sparse around these areas. And so we've added a, a, a lot of sort of example and, um, uh, and, and uh, linking between things so you can easily navigate through different contexts and intents and understand the connection between them. Uh, as well as we've added uh, features that came from real feedback. So now you can, when you listen to a, you know, when you add a context listener to FTC3, you can specify a specific type of context that you want to receive, which was a big improvement for dev ergonomics. And we've also, though they're not specifically part of 1.1, there's been a, a real growth in tooling projects that have started up around FTC3 to help support development. Um, one of those projects I'm going to demo now, and that is the um, Chrome extension project that uh, basically allows you to run the FTC3 APIs in Chrome, which is what I'm going to cut over to. This is an open source project that uh, currently is just in my uh, GitHub account, um, but you can see it there and uh, get it and play around with it. So, one of the first things that this uh, Chrome extension does, and you can see that it's running because you get this um, icon in Chrome that shows that you have the FTC3 agent running, is that it injects the uh, FTC3 API into your Chrome tabs. So if I inspect, I can see that I have access to the FTC3 API as a global. And I can do things like, let's say, I want to call the find intent API for the view chart intent. Um, this is now going to execute a search against my app directory and return a promise, which will resolve with both the details about the intent as well as a list of applications that uh, handle that intent. Um, I can also do things like uh, get system channels and see all the uh, standard channels or the color channels that um, this particular desktop agent supports. Um, I could then use that to um, uh, subscribe to a channel or to broadcast on the channel as well. Um, and I can do things like join a channel. So this is kind of interesting. If you look at this icon up here, when I join the red channel, it's now showing me a badge, a red badge showing that I'm now on the red channel. Um, and I can broadcast a context onto that channel. So if I just call FTC3 broadcast, it's now going to broadcast that onto the red channel. So I can um, see that by, if I open my UI here, I can now search against my app directory and I can open up the channel manager, which is an app that is just a, a uh, demonstration app that has been made available through this app directory. Um, and now I can see all of my system channels and I can see that the, um, Red channel has the context I broadcast onto it. Uh, this also supports other uh, 
actions I can use with an FTC3. So for example, I can now find the intents and apps that are available for this particular context. So if I want to, um, let's say I want to view a chart and I can select the trading view chart. And I now have uh, this chart loaded with the context that was provided there, IBM. What's also interesting is that I can now um, put this chart onto the red channel. And if I change the context, it's now gonna reflect that here. You can see that now the red channel context in my channel manager has been updated. So I wanna copy that, let's say, just for argument's sake, and broadcast that over the orange channel. And now if I change this, the red channel here is changed to Apple. And if I change now my chart to the orange channel, which has IB Microsoft, I will now pick up that context in my chart. Um, one other feature that you can see here of channels is the creation of uh, application channels. So if I create a new channel here, let's call it foo, this is called an application channel. So this is not, these are provided by the system, the color ones, but the, this is a custom channel that just my application has created. But other applications can also listen to it or participate in it. So now my second channel manager is also um, connected to Foo. And now if I update Foo, and broadcast that, my uh, first application gets that update and I could you know, keep doing that, broadcasting back and forth. So you can see that the application for this kind of, these kinds of channel APIs is pretty broad and there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, I'm just gonna cut over to a bit of a more financially specific demonstration of, of some of these features. Um, on the left, you should see a grid that is actually coming from AG Grid. Uh, showing uh, the S&P 500. On the right, you can see FactSet who has implemented FTC3 uh, and a FactSet chart. So this grid is gonna let me do a number of different things with FTC3, um, not just broadcasting context, but also raising intents um, and discovering intents. So first let's try raising an intent. So. Right now, I'm gonna raise an intent for 3M called view chart. And what's gonna happen is that I've just said, hey, I'm interested in this, uh, uh, in seeing a chart for this context. And I will um, get this, Rate rise raises up to my FTC3 um, agent, which will then look at both the app directory as well as applications that are connected to it live and see which ones can support the view chart intent. In this case, this is actually my application instance on the right here, my fax chart, my fax set chart, my right, your left. Um, and so if I uh, choose this one, it's going to send the new context of 3M over to that chart that's now showing IBM. Uh, and I can also, <coughs> excuse me, for example, use this other feature to find uh, intents for this context, which was something we saw before. Um, and in this case, I want to look at a fact set price quote for 3M. And you can see that that works quite nicely. Now, these are not currently on the same channel so I, because I've just directed an intent directly at them. So what I can also do is I could put these all onto the same channel. Let's say I'm going to put them onto the green channel.
And now, as I click through my list here, these fact set apps are going to update. So I just moved to Accenture, and we can see that these have all updated with that context. And you can see how this becomes a very powerful um, way of, of rapidly building uh, really uh, robust workflows uh, between applications. Um, and so this is one of the reasons we are super, super excited about FTC 311 and what it's going to uh, do in terms of driving the momentum forward around things like FTC 3 and interoperability. So I'm going to cut back to uh, just wrap up this demonstration and then we can uh, get into questions. So uh, one of the uh, key themes for this series is open source in finance um, and in and, and helping uh, how, how we can help improve open source and finance um, and enable it. So I wanted to just to wrap up by reflecting on some of the lessons we've learned uh, through uh, working on FTC3. So these are, I've kind of boiled it down to um, five steps that I think we can learn uh, uh, from and that we can apply to other open source projects. So number one, I call find a problem. And this, is extremely important because open source projects are like any other product. You need to really solve a problem for people. And there's open source problems and there's business problems that are better suited to pr proprietary products. But open source problems tend to not be shy and they are very in your face and they're widely distributed. So these are things that people feel compelled to collaborate on. Number two, convince people to care. Um, successful open source projects are a long game and they need to address human problems as much as they address technology problems. So it, it's a slow process. You need to be willing to, as I say, walk to Mordor to make these projects successful. Um, we need to ensure neutrality. Um, so important ways to do this is to be open source from the start and also to make sure that you have a balanced and set of stakeholders and that there, there are many as many stakeholders they can bring to the table as you can to keep that group diverse and and neutral uh, this is ex extremely important in, i think in finance especially um, where you have a lot of competitors sitting down to try to work on something together Um, really critical is finding the least common denominator. This was absolutely essential within FTC3. Uh, you need to keep the bar of adoption as low as possible. You need to find what are the common uh, things that everybody can agree on and, and not get concerned about the rest. If you can't really get consensus on something, it probably just means it's not ready yet to be part of the um, open source effort or in, in the FTC3 case, the standards effort. And then finally, you need to iterate. Keep it simple. Uh, always keep knocking on doors with people and you know, work off of real world use cases as much as possible. Get something out there, get feedback, and then iterate on it. So in conclusion, I, I feel that FTC3 has been successful because of the key values that we've adopted and maintained within the script from the start. And, and to me, those boil down to that we are open source from inception. We've uh, been collaborative by definition. One of the C's within FTC3 stands for collaboration. Uh, don't ask me which one. Uh, and, you know, finally, we're designed for adoption. FTC3 starts small and lets you come in at any level that you want. Um, and again, these are very important for ensuring you can bring as wide a group as possible to the table and 
let people get involved. Um, so with that, I think I'm a little over time for talking. I want to use the rest of the time possibly possible to answer some of your questions. Um, and I do want to also thank everyone again, as well as uh, James and the Finos team for putting this together. So that's amazing, Nick, and thank you very much. But before um, we actually go over to questions, uh, you may, so the part, the people who are attending the call today may have noticed that we're actually um, picking two names out of the hat um, to receive um, two Finos t-shirts, so one each. And so behind the scenes, Aaron has been working hard with his random number, number generator and has selected registrant number 30 and register number 12. And so David Watkins and Mahesh Guru, um, you'll both be receiving a Finos t-shirt each um, as part of being on this webinar. So um, thank you very much for being here and please wear them with pride when we get them over to you. Um, but in the meantime, um, does anybody have any questions that you would like to ask um, Nick as part of, um, you know, as part of his demo and also as part of his um, presentation? Feel free, feel free to come off mute and, and ask your question. Hello, um, my, Enrico Eckstein um, from Adaptive. Um, I have a question for Nick. Um, Nick, what, what do you think will, um, will make um, FTC3 continue to be successful? Um, I, I think, you know, from looking at other open source projects, um, you know, it's, it's quite hard work to make a project to to create a community. Um, it's also relatively easy to for that community to lose momentum and and people to move on from it. So, what do you think um, will make it continually relevant in the future? Hey, thanks, Rico. That's a really excellent question. Um, I'll, I'll try to just give some brief thoughts because we could talk about that all day probably. Um, so I think for FTC3 in particular, it's going to be about getting into uh, more valuable uh, business use cases. So if you look at um, in the stuff I demoed today, it's, it's really kind of nice and it creates a nice user experience, but ultimately, it doesn't solve critical business problems. So one of the things that we're really going to be focused on with FTC3 in the future is looking at how do we um, uh, get more involved with data and interoperability of data. Um, and that means when you raise an intent, maybe you're raising an intent to an application, but maybe you're also raising an intent to resolve a piece of the data. And, and that's, I, I think, going to be uh, a critical thing for keeping FTC3 continuing to be uh, homing in on relevant uh, business cases for the community. Uh, one other thing that I think it's going to be really important is creating much uh, better uh, tooling around adoption. So one of the things that we have seen consistently is that people are really interested in FTC3. Um, but they're not really sure where to start. Uh, that was a, a big impetus behind the creation of the Chrome extension, which is really just a way to give developers a very immediate way to begin interacting with FTC3 and putting it together with things they've already built for the web. Right, that's brilliant. So, um, Nick, I've got two questions here. The first one's going to be from Mahesh, and then the second is going to be from Sam, if that's okay. So, Mahesh, um, do you want to come with me and ask your question, um, or would you like me to ask it on your behalf? If it's all right, I can ask uh, just directly right now. No problem. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, one thing I've seen is that uh, you were able to stream the data um, and have that connection, right? Uh, but how, how did you get... Um, you know, that resolution uh, and be able to like broadcast that kind of stuff very simplistically. Um, because my, like what I've kind of seen is that a lot of people have a challenge of how do you stream data and whether it's like just in the stock markets or whether it's for transactions. 
um, is that, is this program, uh, like something that helps developers get into this mindset or is this uh, something that's just for visualization? Uh, okay. So, um, and I'm not sure which data you're talking about. I was using some live applications in the demo, but in terms of updating between channels, that's done in this, that's done within any FTC three implementation. So if you look at uh, the, you know, an implementation like OpenFin, they have their own uh, service on the desktop that runs and manages the state of the connections and passes information back and forth between applications. With the demo I just showed, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just doing it within a Chrome extension. So there's an extension that's running that the uh, Chrome tabs connect to and that passes information between them. Um, in terms of streaming market data, um, in that case, you would you could enable that through FTC3, but you would need something in your FTC3 implementation connecting to a backend and um, uh, that is providing that data to it, right? If that answers your question. Right, so, so that's great. And so uh, Mahesh, I hope that does um, because I actually want to move quickly over to Sam. Um, he has um, a question to ask. Um, Sam, are you, are you able to, to ask yours? Yeah, can can you hear me okay? I can, absolutely, thank you. Um, it goes back, Nick, to the question of data acquisition and where the value is in FTC3. Um, in, I've spent quite a lot of time talking to people in the commodities industry around decision support data, so pre-trade, pre-OMS, EMS data, where they're trying to acquire and reconcile lots of non-conventional data sources. So we saw in your demonstration uh, data with fairly well understood naming conventions. Do you see uh, an opportunity for data aggregation within FDC3, i.e. small organizations coming in to um, aggregate and acquire data from primary applications. Is there, there certainly seems to be value in the commodity market. There are a lot of corporate organizations trying to acquire um, very, very disparate data sources now. Um, and I kind of sense there might be a, a, a place in, in the ecosystem for something in between the end user and the primary data um, providers. Is that, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what question I'm asking, but it seems to me there's value in there somewhere, but I don't quite understand where it is. Right, yeah, and I, I think that's a great question. And if I can interpret, um, I think that there's parts of that vision that FTC3 uh, can't address. So if we're talking about a uh, aggregation of large amounts of data, where you're going to want to uh, store it uh, in, you know, on a server, um, that's not something that FTC three is really focused on today. But in terms of allowing a um, or enabling an application to expose data services through the client, that is something that FTC3 absolutely could address. So, um, for example, if I've got a uh, one identifier and I want to enhance it with additional information, uh, you could, in FTC3, allow um, a another data provider to be able to uh, make a kind of data service on the client that other applications could use to uh, aggregate additional data that they would need to use to interoperate with other things, for example. That, that is something that I'm very interested in seeing uh, really getting realized in FTC3. The APIs today 
would support it. It's just that um, the kind of pattern hasn't been fully realized in any implementations at this point. Uh, so this this idea, so if you look back at things like web intents, um, for example, one of the ideas there was that a website could expose a service to do something like uh, photo editing. Um, and so if I had a photo, I could discover a photo editing service, send my photo to that service, edit it, and then send the resulting uh, image back to my original application. Doing something like that with a symbol where I could say, hey, I've got a symbol, I wanna get a quote for it. Very simple example. Um, I find a service that can give me a quote for that symbol. I send my symbol over, get the quote back, and now can reuse that data in my initial application would be a very powerful next place for FTC3 to go to. Thanks. Right, so Nick, um, I would like to uh, open a question up from Rob Underwood. Um, Rob, if you'd like to quickly open your mic and ask um, Nick a question. Sure, it's, it's not a question, although I, I, I appreciate that. So I just wanted to quickly mention to the person who just asked, um, if, if you're interested in commodities data, we have actually just this past two weeks stood up a new working group within the new Alloy project, um, the Alloy modeling tool that was contributed by Goldman Sachs um, focused on commodities data specifically. They're looking for said oil swaps. So if that's an area of interest to you, feel free to follow up to me uh, with me. There's also our, uh, in our data technologies program within Finos, we have our security reference data project, which work, looks at the broad swath of different types of reference data. So if the shape of reference data, or you know, in this case, you know, commodities data, including um, um, pre-market or pre-sale data is of interest to you. There's two different groups within Finos that are looking at that right now. So feel free to follow up. I'm Rob Underwood at Finos.org and I can get you connected. That's amazing, Rob. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, uh, it's nearly 40 minutes past the hour. And so we went a few minutes over. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody who's attended uh, this afternoon's virtual meetup. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who asked a question. For those who we haven't answered, um, we're actually going to be recording a podcast with Nick, um, which we'll be publishing later. Um, and we're also going to ask Nick if we can share his slides on LinkedIn, um, where we'll be running kind of um, an offline Q&A. And so if you haven't subscribed to the um, Finos page on LinkedIn, um, feel free to go over there now and subscribe and you'll see um, Nick's slides come up there. So Nick, I don't know if you have um, any final words before we end? Uh, no, I just wanna thank everybody and please, um... You know, if, if this was interesting to you and you're not already involved with FTC3, please reach out to the group and, and get involved. Uh, we are a friendly group of people and uh, we're always looking for additional participants. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you very much, Nick. And I look forward to meeting everybody on the next uh, webinar, which will be with Tom Shady. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.